Chapter Seventeen of the Wonderful Adventures of Fra the Phoenician by Edwin Lester Arnold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I cannot say distinctly what roused me next morning. My faculties were all in a maze, my body cramped and stiff as old leather, no doubt due to the wetting of the previous evening, or my hard couch, while the darkness bewildered and numbed my mind. Yet, indeed, I awoke, and, after all, that was the great thing. I awoke and yawned, and feebly stretched my dry and aching arms. Good heavens! How the pain did fly and shoot about them, and rolled my stiff and rusty eyeballs, and twisted that pulsing neck that seemed in that first moment of returning life like a burning column of metal, through which the hot river of my starting blood was surging in a hissing molten stream. I stretched and looked and listened, as though my faculties were helpless prisoners behind my numb, useless senses, but peer and crane forward as I would, nothing stirred the black stillness of my strange bedchamber. Nothing, did I say? Truly, it was nothing for a time, and then I could have sworn, by all the rich repository of gods and saints, that the wreck of twenty hierarchies had stranded in my mind that I heard a real material sound, a click and a rattle, like metal striking stone, this being followed immediately by a star of light somewhere in the mid-black void in front. Fie! Twas but a freak of fancy, the stretching of my cramped and aching sinews, but a nucleus of those swimming lights that mocked my still sleepy eyes. I covered them with my hands and groaned to be awake, I strove to make point or sense out of the wild flood of remembrance that ebbed and flooded in thunderous sequence through my head, and then again, obtrusive and clear, came the click, click of the unseen metal, and the shine of the great white planet that burnt in the black firmament of my prison behind it. I staggered to my feet, stretching out eager hands in the void space, to touch the walls, and try to move and as I did so, my knees gave way beneath me. I made a wild grasp in the darkness, and fell in a loose heap upon the littered dusty floor. Lord, how my joints did ache! How the hot, swift throes that monopolised my being shot here and there about my cramped and twitching limbs! I rolled upon the dust-dry earth of that gloomy chamber, and cursed my last night's wetting, cursed the salt sea spray that could breed such fiery torments, and even sent to Hades my errand and my scrip of victory, the which, however, I was cheered to note, in its bronze case now and then, with a movement or a spasm of pain, knocked against my bare ribs as though to upbraid me as a laggard embassy for lying sleeping here while all men wake to know my tidings. I rose again with rare difficulty, but successfully this time, and peered and listened till the dancing colours in my eyes filled the empty air with giddy spinning suns and constellations and the making tide of wakefulness flooding the channels of my veins cheated my ears to fancy some hideous storm was raging up above and thunderbolts were tearing shrieking furrows down the trembling sides of mountains and all the rivers of the world so hideous was that shocking sound were tumbling headlong in wild confusion into the void middle of the world. I stuffed my ears and shut my eyes, and turned sick and faint at that infernal tumult. My head spun and throbbed, and my light feet felt the world give under them. I had nearly fallen, when once again, just as my spinning brain was growing numb, and the close thin air of that place failed to answer to the needs of my new vitality, there came that click, click, again and the blessed white star that followed it this time that gleam of hope was broad and strong on either side as it shone white zigzag rays flew out and stood so writ upon the black tablet of my prison ah and a draught of nectar of real divine nectar of sweet white country air came in from that celestial puncture i leapt to it and knelt and put my thirsty lips to that refulgence, and drank the simple ambient air that came through, as though I were some thirsty pilgrim at a gushing stream, and it revived me, 
cooling the rising fever of my blood and numbing like the sweet sedative it was the pains that soon ran less keen and throbbed less strong and in a few more minutes went gently away into the distance under its beneficent touch mayhap i fainted or slept for some little time overwhelmed by the stress of those few waking moments when i looked up again all was changed i myself was new and fresh and felt with every pulse the strong life beating firm and gentle within me and my prison cell it was no more a prison there was a gap bigger than my fist where the star had been with great fissures marking the outline of one of the stones that had supported the topmost slab and through the gap a peep of countryside of yellow grass and sapphire sea of pearly waves lisping in the summer playfulness around a golden shore and overhead a sky of delightful blue i was grateful and understood it all the storm had gone down during the night and the sun had risen these were good folk outside who by some chance knew of my sheltering place and had come early to release me a happy chance indeed and it was their strong blows and crowbars working on my massive walls that let in the light and none too soon refreshed me with a draught of outer air fool that i was to let an uneasy night and a salt sea soaking cloud my wit i was so pleased at the prospect of speedy release that i was on the point of calling out to cheer my lusty friends at their work and show the prisoner lived but had i done so this book had never been written that shout was all but uttered my mouth was close to the orifice through which came the patient gleam of daylight when voices of men outside speaking one to another fell upon my ear by st george i heard one fellow say and every fiend in hell that you built this place surely meant it to last to judgment here we have been even at it since near daylight and not moved a stone oh and if you stand gaping there chimed in another we'll not have moved one by tuesday week on your log let's see something of that strength you brag of why even now i saw a shine and a twinkle in the opening there this crib may prove to be the cradle of our fortunes may make us richer men than any strutting sheriffs and recompense us for a dozen disappointments to it again and you harry stand ready with the wedges to put them in when we do lift i pricked my ears at this as you will guess for there was no mention of me expectant and only talk of wealth and recompense i listened and heard the sulky workman take again his crowbar i heard him call for a drink and the splash of the liquid into the leathern cup sounded wonderfully clear in my silent chamber then as though in no hurry to fall on he asked what of the spoil we have already mates a sight of those baubles would greatly lighten our labour i think now as i had a man for my father burst out the first speaker never did i see so small a heart in so big a body show him the swag harry rattle it under his greedy nose and when he's done gloating on it perhaps he'll turn to and do something for a breakfast at this there was a pause and a moving of feet as though men were collecting round some common object then came the tinkle of metals and by jove i had not yet forgotten so much of merchant cunning in my soldiering but that i recognised the music of gold and silver over the base clink of lesser stuff they tried and sampled and wrung those wares over my head and presently he who was best among them said a very pretty old mate and wisely disposed of enough to furnish as well both inside and out for a long time these circlets in here are silver i take it and will run into a sweet ingot in the smelting pot yon boss is a brooch by the pin and of gold though surely such a vile fashion was never forged since shem's hammer last went silent what gold sir ah what else old bullet costard dost thou think i come round and prize cursed devil haunted mounds for lumps of clay the brooch is gold i say and the least of these trinkets whereon there came a sound like one playing with bracelet and bangle the worst of them white silver to it then good fellows again burst me this stony crypt and if it proves such a coffer as i have right to hope before the day is an hour older you shall down to yonder town and there get drunk past expectation 
and your happiest imaginings so my friends i mused tis not pure neighbourliness that brings you thus early to my rescue never mind many a good deed has been done in search of a sordid object and whether you come for me or gold it shall vantage me alike i will lend a hand on my side since it were a pity to keep this big fellow from his breakfast longer than need be while they plied spade and lever outside i scraped below and put in as well as i was able a stone wedge now and then whenever their exertions canted the great stone a little to one side or the other the interest of all this and because i was never apt in deceit made me somewhat reckless about showing too soon at the narrow opening and presently there came a guttural cry above and a sound as though some one had dropped a tool and sprung back hello stout art called the captain's voice what now is it another swig of a flask you want to swell your shallow courage or has thy puissant crowbar pierced through to hell hell or not whined the fellow i do think the fiend himself is in there i did but stoop on a sudden appear within and may i never empty a flagon again but there was something hideous moving in the crypt something round and shaggy that toiled as we toiled and pushed and growled and had two flaming yellow eyes Baste coward oh that i have brought a man instead of thee twas gold you saw bright shining metal think thou swine of it all it will buy and how thou mayest hereafter wallow in thy foul delights and wilt thou forego the stuff so near gods i would have a wrestle for it though it were with the devil himself give me the crowbar apparently the captain's avarice was of stouter kind than the yeoman's for soon after this the stone upright began to give and i saw the moment of my deliverance was near now i argued to myself these gentlemen outside are obvious rogues and will much rather crack me on the head than share their booty with such a strange found claimant hence i must be watchful of the two under rogues i had small fear but the captain seemed of bolder mould and unless his tongue lied had some sort of heart within him so i waited watchful and before long a more than usually stalwart blow set the stone off its balance it slipped and leant then fell headlong outwards with a heavy thud and turning over on its side rolled to the edge of the slope and there revolving quicker and more quickly went rumbling and crashing down through the brambles into the valley a quarter of a mile below as it fell outwards a blaze of daylight burst in upon my prison and with a shout of joy the foremost of the rogues dashed into my cell at the same moment with such an old british battle yell as those monoliths had not heard for a thousand years but sorely dazed i sprang forward we met in mid-career and the big thief went floundering down he was up again in a moment and yelling in his fear that the devil was certainly there rushed forth i close behind him and infected his timorous comrade and away they both went towards the woods racing in step and screaming in tune as though they had practised it together for half a lifetime the fellows fled but their leader stood white and irresolute as he well might be yet made bold by greed and for a moment we faced each other he in his greasy townsman finery a strong sullen thief from bonnet to shoe and i grim gaunt and ragged haggard wild unshorn standing there for a moment against the black porch of the old druid grave place and then wiping the sunshine from my dazzled eyes and stooping low i ran at him many were the ribbons and trinkets i had taken long ago at that game i ran at him and threw my arms round his leather-belted middle and with a good saxon twist tossed his heels fairly into the air and threw him full length over my shoulder he fell behind me like a tree on the greensward while his head striking the buttress of a stone stunned him and he lay there bleeding and insensible oh good fellow i laughed bending over him i'm sorry for that headache you will have to-morrow but before you challenge so freely to the wrestle you should know somewhat more of a foeman's prowess when i turned to the little heap of spoil the ravishers of the dead had gathered and laid out on a cloth upon the stones 
at once my mood softened there in that curious pile of trinkets were things so ancient and yet so fresh that i heaved a sigh as i bent over them and a whiff of the old time came back the jolly wild days when the world was young rose before me as i turned them gently one by one there lay the bronze knobs from a british shield and there corroded and thin the long flat blade that my rugged comrades once could use so well there was the broken haft of a wheel scythe from a chief's battle car and near by the green and dinted harness of a war horse oath how it took me back how it made me here again in the lap of the soft plantagenet sea and all the insipid sounds of this degenerate countryside the rattle and hum of the chariots as we raced to war the sparkle and clatter of the captains galloping through the leafy british woods and then the shout and the tumult as we wheeled into line in the open and our loose reins on the stallion's necks and our trembling javelins quivering in our ready hands swept down upon the ranks of the reeling foeman there again in more peaceful wise was a shoulder brooch some british maid had worn and the wristlet and rings of some red-haired helen of an unfamous troy there lay a few links of the neck chains of a dust-dead warrior and there again the head of his boar spear here was the thin gold circlet he had on his finger the rude pin of brass that fastened his coloured cloak and the buckle of his sandal jove i could nearly tell the names of the vanished wearers i knew all these things so well but it was no use hanging over the pile like this the ruffian i had felled was beginning to move and it served no purpose to remain therefore and muttering to myself that i was a nearer heir to the treasure than any among those thieves i selected some dozen of the fairest most valuable trinkets and put them in my wallet then feeling cold for the fresh morning air was thin and cool here above the sea the best coat from the ragged pile the rogues had thrown aside to be the lighter at their work was chosen and with this on my back and a stout stave in my hand i turned to go but ere i went i took a last look round as was only natural at a place that had given me such timely shelter overnight it was strange very strange but my surroundings as i saw them in the white daylight matched wondrous poorly with my remembrance of the evening before the sea to begin with seemed much farther off than it had done in the darkness i have said that when i swam ashore my well-remembered british harbour had to my eyes silted up woefully so that the knoll on which blodwyn's stockades had once stood was some way up the valley but small as the estuary had shrunk last night i had it seemed but poorly estimated its shrinkage twas lesser than ever this morning and some kine were grazing among the yellow kingcups on the marshy flats at that very place where i could have sworn i came ashore on the top of a sturdy breaker the greedy green and golden land was cozening the blue channel sea out of beach and foreshore under my very eyes the meadow larks were playing where the white surf should have been and tall fern and mallow flaunted victorious in the breeze where ancient british keels had never even grated on a sandy bottom i could not make it out and turned to look at the tomb from which i had crept here too the turmoil of yester e'en and my sick and weary head had cheated me in the gloom the pile had appeared a bare and lichened heap washed out from its old mound by rains jove it seemed it was not so i rubbed my eyes and pulled my peaked beard and stared about me for the crypt was a grassy mound again with one black gap framed by a few rugged stones jutting from the green as though the slope above it had slipped down at that leveller nature's prompting and piled up earth and rubbish against the rocks had escaladed them and marched triumphant up the green glassy planting her conquering pennons of bracken and bramble mild daisy and nodding foxglove on that very arch where by all the gods i thought last night the withering lightning would have glanced harmless from a smooth and lichened surface well it only showed how weary i had been so shouldering my cudgel and with a last sigh cast back to that pregnant heap of rusty metal i turned and with fair heart but somewhat shaky limbs 
marched off inland to give my wondrous news how pleasant and fair the country was and after those hot scenes of battle the noise and sheen of which still floated confusedly in my head how sweetly peaceful i trod the green secluded country lanes with wondrous pleasure remembering the bare french campagnas and stood stock still at every gap in the blooming hedges to drink the sweet breath of morning coming golden laden with sunshine and the breath of flowers over the rippling meadow grass in truth i was more english than i had thought my step was more elastic to tread those dear domestic lees and my spirits rose with every mile simply to know i was in england and i a tough stern soldier with arms still red to the elbow in the horrid dye of war and on a hasty errand pulled me a flowering spray from the coppices and smiled and sang as i went along now stopping in delighted trance to hear out the nightingale that from a bramble athwart the thicket path sang most enrapturedly and then forgetful of my haste standing amazed under the flushed satin of the blooming apples jove i laughed here is a sweeter pavilion than any victor prince doth sleep in fie to fight and bleed as we do yonder while the sweetness of such a tent as this goes all to waste upon the wind and i sat and stared and laughed until the prick of conscience stirred me and reluctant i passed on again then over a flowery mead or two where the banded bees swung in busy fashion at the lilac cuckoo flowers and the shining dewdrops were charged with a hundred hues down to a sunny babbling brook that sparkled by a yellow ford there i would stand and watch the silver fingers of the stream toy and tug the great heads of nodding kingcup watch the flash of the new-come swallow's wing as he shot through the byways between the mallows and be so still that e'en the timid water-hen led out her brood across the freckled play of sunshine on the water and the mute kingfisher came to the broken rail and did not fear me surely a happy stream i thought not to divide two princely neighbours what a blessed current that can keep its native colour and chatter thus of flowers and sunshine while yon other torrent runs in carnadine to the sea a corpse choked sewer of red ambition then it was a homestead that all unseen i paused by watching the great sleek kine knee-deep in the scented yellow straw the spangled cock defiant on the wall the tender doves a-wooing on the roof-ridge and presently the swart herdsman with flail and goad come out from beneath his roses and stoop and kiss the pouting cherry lips of the sweet babe his comely mate held up to him jove i meditated and here's a goodly kingdom oh that i had a realm with no politics in it but such as he has and so musing i went along from path to path and hill to hill at one time my feet were turned to a wayside rest-house where a jug of wine was asked for and a loaf of bread for you will remember that saving a handful of dry biscuit which i broke in my gauntlet palm and ate between two charges i had not broken fast since the morning before crecy the master of the tavern took up the coin i tendered and eyed it critically he held it in the sun and wrung it on a stone and spat upon it then taking a little dust from the road rubbed diligently until he came down through the green sea slime to the metal below it was true coined plump and full though certainly a trifle rusty and this and my grim commanding figure in his doorway carried the day he brought me wine and cheese and bread whereon i sat on a corner of the trestle table munching them outside in the sun under the shadow of my broad felt yokel hat with the quaint insign gently creaking overhead and my mouldy sea-stained legs dangling under me i was in a good mood yet thoughtful somehow for had not the king especially warned me not to part lightly with the precious news wherewith i was freighted and if so be that i must be reticent in this particular yet again my heart was surely too full of my victorious errand to let me gossip lightly on trivial matters thus my bread was broken in abstracted silence and when my beaker went now and again into the shade of my hat-brim 
i drank mutely and proffered no sign of friendship to those other country wayfarers who stood about the honeysuckle doorway eyeing me askance after the manner i was so used to and whispering now and then to one another i sat and thought how my errand was to be most speedily carried out for you see i might trudge days and days afoot like this before good luck or my own limbs brought me to the footstool of edward's royal wife and gave me leave to burst that green and rusty case that with its precious scroll still dangled at my side i had no money to buy a horse the bangles taken from the crypt thieves would not stand against the value of the boniest palfrey that ever ambled between a tinker's legs and last night's infernal wetting had made me into the sorriest most mouldy-looking herald that ever did a kingly bidding surely i thought as i glanced at my borrowed clay-stained rustic cloak my cracked and rotten leather doublet my tarnished hose all frayed and colourless my shoon that only held together methought by their patching of grey sea-slime and mud surely no one will lend or loan me anything like this they will laugh at my nightly gauge of honourable return and scout the faintest whisper of my errand thus ruefully reflecting i had finished my frugal luncheon yet still scarce knew what to do and maybe i had sat dubious like that on the trestle edge for near an hour when looking up on a sudden there was a blooming little maid of some three tender years standing in the sun staring hard upon me her fair blue eyes ashine with wonder and the strands of her golden hair lifting on the breeze like gossamers in june she had in one rosebud hand a flower of yellow daffodil and in fault of better introduction proffered it to me my stern soldier heart was melted by that maid i took her flower and put it in my belt and lifted the little one on my knee then asked her why she had looked so hard at the stranger oh she said pointing to where some older children were watching all this from a safe distance johnny and andrew my brothers said you were surely the devil and as they feared i came myself to see if it were true and am i is it true i do not know said the little damsel fixing her clear blue eyes upon mine i do not know for certain but i like you i am sorry for you because you are so dirty if you were cleaner i could love you and very cautiously watching my eyes the while the pretty babe put out a petal soft hand and stroked my grim and weathered face i could not withstand such gentle blandishment and forgot all my musings and my haste and kissed those pink fingers under the shadow of my hat and laid myself out to win that soft little heart and won it so that when presently the wondering mother came to claim her own the little maiden burst into such a headlong shower of silver april tears that i had to perjure myself with false promises to come again and even the gift of my last coin and another kiss or two scarce set me free from the sweet investigator but now i was aroused and stalked down the green country road full of speed and good intention i would walk to the royal city since there were no other way and these fair shires must have grown expansive since the olden days if i could not see a march or two while the sun was up eastward and north i knew the court should lie so bent my steps through glades and commons with the midday sun behind my better shoulder but the journey was to be shorter than seemed likely at the outset after asking to no purpose my road of several rustics a venerable wayfarer was chanced upon ambling down a shady gully this quaint old fellow sat a rough little steed one indeed of the poorest looking most knock-kneed beasts i had ever seen a gentleman of gentle quality astride of and in truth the rider was not better kept he wore a great wide-spreading cloak of threadbare stuff falling from his shoulders to his knees in such ample folds that it half hid the neck and quarters of his steed below this mantle splashed with twenty shades of mud and most quaintly patched you saw the pricks of rusty iron spears on old and shabby leather boots and just the point of a frayed black leather scabbard peeping under his stirrup straps the hat he wore was broad-brimmed and peaked and looked near as old as did its wearer 
under that shapeless cover was the most strange face i do not think i ever saw so much and various writ upon so little parchment as shone upon the dry and wrinkled surface of that rider's features there were cunning and closeness on it and yet they did not altogether hide the openness of gentle birth and liberal thought now you would think to watch those shrewd keen eyes a-glitter there under the penthouse of his shaggy eyebrows he was some paltry trader with a vision bounded by his weekly till and the infruct of his lying measures and then anon at some word or passing fancy as you came to know him better twas strange to see how eagle-like those optics shone and with what a clear bright prophetic gaze the old fellow would stare like a steersman through the dim-lit gloom of a starry night over the wide horizon of the visionary and uncertain he could look as small and mean about the mouth as a usurer on settling day and then when his mood changed and he fell thoughtful the gentle melancholy of his face the goodly soul that spoke behind that changeful mask the strange dissatisfaction the incompleteness the unhappy longing for something unattainable there reflected made you sad to look upon it i overtook this quaint rider as he rode alone my active feet being more than a match for the shaky limbs of that mean beast he sat upon and coming alongside observed him unnoticed for a minute truly as quaint a fellow-traveller as you could meet his head was sunk and his grizzled white beard fell over his chest his eyes were fixed in vacant stare on some vision of the future and his lips moved tremulously now and again as the thoughts of his mind escaped unheeded from between them was he poet was he seer was it a black past or a red rosy future the old fellow babbled of jove i was not in very good kind myself and i fancy i had read now and again in the wonder of those who saw me that my face had a tale to tell but by the great gods i was neat and pretty pied beside this most rusty gentleman my face was as void as a curd-fed bumpkins compared to those eloquently absent eyes that fine mean profile there in the slouch of the big hat and those busy lips good morning sir i said and as the old man looked up with a start and saw me a stranger walking by his side all the fervour and the fancy died from off his face the fine features shut upon themselves and there he was the meanest shallowest most paltry looking of old rogues that had ever pulled off a cap to his equal he returned my first light questionings with a sullen suspicion which gradually thawed however as his keen scrutiny took apparently reassuring stock of my face and figure and we spoke as fellow-travellers will for a few moments on the roads the weather and the prospect of the skies then i asked him with small expectation of much advantage in his answer which way was the best way to court there are many ways my son he said you may get there because of extreme virtue or on the introduction of peculiar wickedness ah but i meant otherwise shining wisdom they say brings a man to court or should and god knows there is no place like court for folly if thou art very beautiful thou may come to it and if thou art as ugly as hell they will have thee for a laughing-stock and a nine days wonder anaximander went to court because he was so wise and anaxippus because he was so foolish diphilus because he was so slow in penmanship and antimachus because he wrote so much and swift ah friend many are the ways polypemon lived by plunder and because he was the cruellest thief that ever stripped a wanderer by green cephisus he came under the notice of kings and gods ay and clytius is famous because he was so faithful and the patriotic codrus because he bared his bosom to the foe and spendius for a hundred treacheries and no no i cried no more sir i entreat i did not mean to play footpad to thy capacious memory and rob your mind of all these just comparisons but only to ask in ordinary material manner which was the best way to the palace which the nearest road the safest footpath for a hasty stranger to our good queen's footstool i have a royal script to deliver to her what 
is it the queen you want to see why i am bound that road myself and in a few minutes i will show you the pennons glancing among the trees where they be camped where they be camped i exclaimed in wonder i thought that was many a mile from here in fact sir in the great city itself and yet you say a few minutes will show us the royal tents oh what a blessed thing a youthful legs and were you off to distant westminster like that good fellow to see the queen forsooth with nothing in thy wallet and as little in thy head and the old man eyed me under his slouching cap with a mixture of derision and strange curiosity i tell you sir i answered i come on hasty business i am a messenger of the utmost urgency and if i am afoot instead of mounted it is more misfortune than inclination what brings the queen if indeed we are so near her thus far afield praise heaven young man there is no one who knows less of the goings and comings of her and hers than i do i hate them he said sourly a lying swarm of locusts round that yellow jade they call a queen a shallow cruel worthless crew who stand in the way of light and learning and laugh the poor scholar out of face and heart and muttering to himself my companion relapsed into a moody silence as we breasted the last rise but on a sudden he looked up with something like a smile wrinkling his withered cheek and went on but you do not laugh you have some bowels of compunction with you you can be as civil to a threadbare cloak as to a silken doublet gads fellow there is something about thee that moves me very strangely art thou of gentle quality i have been of many qualities in my time sir so i guessed and something tells me we shall see more of one another there is a presence about thee that makes me fear that puts a dread upon me why i know not and then again i feel drawn to thee by a strong strange sense as the persian says one planet is drawn towards another i let the old fellow ramble on paying indeed but cold notice to his chatter since all my thoughts were on ahead and when at last we came out of the hazel dingles there sure enough down in the valley was a white road winding among the trees and a stately park a goodly house of many windows and amid the fair meadows among the branches shone the white gleam of tents and overhead the flutter of silken tags and gonfalons and now and then there came the glint of steel and gold from out that goodly show and the blare of trumpets and more softly on the afternoon air the shout of busy marshals the neighing of steeds and the low murmur of many voices oh it was a pretty scene to see the tender countryside so fresh and green and the rolling meadows at our feet dusted thick with gold and silver flowers all blended in a splendid web of tissue under the shining sun and there the flush of blossom on the orchard streaked the fair valley like a sunset cloud and here the bronze of budding oaks lay soft in the hollows while overhead the blue canopy of the sky was one unbroken roof from verge to verge we too looked down upon that scene of peace with a different feeling for a space then making my friendly salutation to the dreamy pedant here sir i said i fear we part for ever not so he said we shall meet once more and soon well well soon or distant we will meet again in friendship and with a wave of the hand off i set delighted to think chance had so favoured me and all impatient to tell my news i did not stop to look to left or right but down the glen i ran into the valley scaring the frightened sheep and oxen and stopping not for fence or boundary until the broad road was reached and all among the groups of gaping countrymen and busy lackeys leading out the steeds to water in the meadows round the royal camp i slackened my pace the broad park gates were open and inside amid the oak trees around the great house gay confusion reigned there on one hand were the fair white tents bright with silk and golden trappings and while a hundred sturdy yeomen were busy setting up these cool pavilions others spread costly rugs about their porches and displayed within them lordly furniture 
enough to dazzle such rough soldier eyes as mine there in long rows beneath the branches were ranked a wondrous show of mighty gilded coaches with empty shafts a trail all still dusty from the road and hurrying grooms were covering these over for the night while others fed and tended a squadron of sleek fat horses whose beribboned manes and glistening hides so well filled out struck me amazed when i recalled those poor ragged muddy chargers whereon we had borne down the hosts of philip's chivalry two days before all about the green were groups of gallant gentlemen and ladies and i overheard as i brushed by some of them speaking of a splendid show to be given that night in the court of the great house near by and how the proud owner of it thus honoured by the great queen's presence had beggared him and his for many a day in making preparation it was most probable for the white-haired seneschal was tearing his snowy locks entreating imploring amid a surging unruly mass of porters cooks and scullions while heaps of provender vats of wine and mighty piles of food for men and horses littered all the rearward avenues but little i looked at all these things clad like many another countryman come there to see the show only a little more ragged and uncouth i passed the outer wickets and skirting the groups of idlers strode boldly out across the trim inner lawns and breasted the wide sweep of steps that led to the great scutcheon doorway all down these steps gilded fellows were lolling in splendid finery who started up and stared at me as nothing noticing their gentle presence now hot upon my errand i bounded by at top were two strong yeomen gay in crimson and black livery of most quaint kind with rampant lions worked in gold upon their breasts and tall broad-bladed halberds in their hands they made a show of barring the way with those mighty weapons but i came so unexpected and showed so little hesitation they faltered also i had pulled off my cap and better men than they had stepped back in fear and wonder from a glance of that grim stern face that i thus did show them past these and once inside i found the queen was receiving the country folk and up the waiting avenue of these good rustic lieges i pushed brushing through the feeble fence of steward's marshalling rods held out to awe and nothing noticing a score of curly pages who threw themselves before me i burst into the presence chamber hoth twas a fine room like the mid aisle of a great cathedral and all around the walls were banners and bannerets antlers of deer and goodly shows of weapons and suits of mail and harness and this splendid lobby was thronged with courtiers in silks and satins while ruffs and stocks and mighty collarets and pearls and gems and cloth of gold and sarsenet glittered everywhere and a gentle incense of lovely scents mingled with a murmur of courtly talk went up to the fair carved oaken ceiling right ahead of me was a splendid crimson carpet of wondrous pile and softness and at the far end of that stately way a dais and on it lightly chatting amid a pause in the royal business the queen she was not the least what i had looked for i had pictured edward's noble dame the daughter of the knightly house of hainault as pale and proud and dark the fit wife to her warlike husband and a meet mother to her son but this one was lank and yellow comely enough no doubt and tall with a mighty proud light in her eyes when occasion served and a right royal bearing yet still somehow not quite that which i expected what did it matter was it not the queen and was not that enough gods what should it count what colour was her hair since my master found it good enough and in truth but i had something to say that would bring the red into those lacklustre cheeks or philippa were unlike all other women therefore with a shout of triumph that shocked the mild courtiers brandishing my precious script above my head i leapt forward and dashing up that open crimson road ran straight to the footstool of the royal lady and there dropping on one knee hail royal mother i cried thanks she said sardonically 
as soon as she regained her composure thanks gentle maid madam i cried i come a herald charged with splendid news of conquest but one day since over in famous france thy loyal english troops have won such a victory against mighty odds as lends a new lustre even to the broad page of english valour but one day since in your noble general's tent but by this time all the throng of courtiers had found their tongues and some certain quantity of those senses whereof my sudden entry had bereft them while a few who caught the meaning of my word and stopping not to argue thought it was the news indeed of a victory that glittering court had long hoped for broke out into tumultuous cheering waving scarf and handkerchief and throwing wide the lattices that the common folk without might share their noisy joy those others who stood closer around and saw my ragged habiliments could not believe it you a herald exclaimed one grizzled veteran in slashed black velvet over pearly satin you a messenger chosen for such an errand madam he cried drawing out a long rapier from its velvet case it is some madman some brain-sick soldier i do implore your grace to let me call the guards an assassin an assassin cried another run him through lord fodringham give him no chance or parley tis past belief exclaimed a dainty fellow all perfumed lace and golden chains such glad tidings are not trusted to base country curse a fool a rogue a graceless villain they shouted stab him drag him from the presence fie upon the billmen to let such scullions in upon us and thick these pretty peers came clustering on me the while their ladies screamed and all was stormy tumult up then i jumped to my feet and hot and wrathful shaking my clenched fist in the faces of those glittering lords broke out by the bright light of day sirs he who says i have a better here in this hall lies lies loud and flatly do you think because i come clad like this you may safely spend your shallow wit upon me i tell you all pretty silken spaniels that you are you fodringham with the gilded toothpick you miscall a sword you there sir who reek of musk and valour and all you others who keep so discreetly out of arm's reach i tell you every one that in court or camp in tilt or tawny i am your mate ah sirs and this rusty country smock blazoned by miry ways and hasty travel this muddy tabard here because tis upon a herald's breast is more honourable wear than any silken surtout that you boast of god's gentlemen if so there be that any one here in truth misdoubts it let me entreat his patience let me humbly crave the boon that he will hold his mettled valour in curb just so long as i may render that message which i surely have at this royal footstool and then on horse or foot with mace or sword i will show him my credentials but none of that glittering throng had aught to say those bold silken lordlings pushed back in a wide circle from where i stood fierce and tall in my muddy rags and fumbled their golden dagger knobs and studied with drooped heads the dainty silk rosettes upon their cork-heeled shoes after waiting a moment to give their valour fair chance of answering i turned disdainfully from them and bending again to fair queen philippa madam i said these noisy boys make me forget the smooth reverence that i owe your grace yet surely the noble daughter of hainault will forgive a hasty word spoken in defence of soldier honour i know nothing good fellow replied the queen eyeing her discomfited nobles with inward glee of thy hainault but i like thy outspokenness extremely by heaven you make me think it was some time since i last saw a man about me and have i leave to do my mission noble lady ay sir to it at once we care not how you come or who you are or for the exact condition of your smock so that you bring news of victory but madam put in fodringham it is not safe he has some desperate purpose silence shouted the queen springing to her feet and stamping a pretty foot cased in a dainty pearl-encrusted slipper 
silence i say lord fodringham and all you other peers who make our presence chamber like a bear pit silence or by my father's heart i will cure him of insolence who speaks again for once and all and the sallow virago flushing like an angry yellow sunset with her fierce grey eyes agleam and her thin lips stern set one white hand clutching the high carved arm of her dais and the other set like white ivory on the jewelled handle of her fan scowled round upon her courtiers they knew that proud termagant too well to meet her eye and having stared them all into meek silence she let the yellow flush die from her cheek and turning to me she said now fellow to thy errand then sovereign lady i began but two days since in france the english troops fair set upon a sunny hillside were attacked by a vast array of foemen and thanks to happy chance to thy princely general's captainship and to the incredible valour of thy lieges they were victorious now may the dear god who rules these things accept my grateful and most humble thanks and the proud queen with bright moisture in her eye looked skyward for a moment and was so moved with true joy and pleasure in her country's conquest that thereon at once she went up most mightily in my esteem most welcome of all heralds she went on how fared the english leader in that desperate fight if aught has happed to lord leicester it will spoil all else that you can say footnote the earl of leicester in the spring of fifteen eighty six had command of the english forces in flanders and news of the great victory which he constantly promised but never achieved was daily expected End of footnote i did not quite catch the name she mentioned under breath but i thought it was the royal mother asking how my noble young master had prospered so i spoke out at once madam he is unhurt and well it is not for me a humble knight to praise that shining star of honour but he for whom thou art so naturally solicitous here the queen blushed a little and looked down while there was a scarce suppressed laugh among the fair damsels behind me he madam has done splendid deeds of valour three times noble queen right along the glittering front of france he charged three times he pierced so deep into that sea of steel that he near lay hands upon their golden lilies in mid-host the proud count of poligny fell before him and the lord of lusigny was overthrown in single combat besancon and arnay went down under his maiden spear he pulled an ancient crest from the bohemian eagle in mid-battle in brief madam a more valorous knight was never buckled into armour he was the prop and pillar of our host and to him this victory is as largely due as it is to any herald said the queen with real gratitude and pleasure in her voice again indeed your news is welcome there was nothing i had rather than such a victory and because tis his because it will stifle the envious clamour of his enemies and embolden me to do that which i hope to oh your news fills up to overflowing the measure of my joy and satisfaction and the fair lady bent her head and fell into a reverie like a maid who cogitates upon the prowess of an absent lover so far the woman then the queen came back and lifting her shapely head with its high piled yellow hair laced with strings of amethyst and pearl and well set off by the stiff starched ruff behind she asked and my dear english nobles and my stout halberdiers and pikemen god forgive me that i should forget them how told the fight upon them my heart bleeds to think of the odds you say they did withstand be comforted fair sovereign the tide of war sets strong against our enemies our palisades and trenches were well laid the keen english arrows carried disaster far afield on their iron points ere the battle joined the great host of france fell by its own mightiness and victory this time at least shall wring but few tears from english maids or matrons heaven be truly thanked for that indeed madam so i went on none of great account fell those few hours since lord harcourt i saw bear him like the bold soldier that he was and when the battle faded into evening 
he it was who marshalled our scattered ranks and set the order for the night who did you say harcourt lady thy bold captain and codrington too was redoubtable and came safe from the fight chandos dealt out death to all who crossed his path like an avenging fury yet took no scratch hot lord walsingham swept like an avalanche in spring through the close-packed frenchman yet lives to tell of it and old sir john fitzherbert when i left the field his white beard all athwart his shredded broken armour was cheering loudly for our victory the while they lapped him up in linens for a french axe had shorn his left arm off at the shoulder all have taken dints but near all are safe and well tis strange said the queen thoughtfully tis strange i know so few of these i have a harcourt but he is not warlike and cunning cruel walsingham lives in the north and sits better astride of a dinner-stool than a charger codrington and fitzherbert leading my troops to war here let me see thy script it may explain and she held out her jewelled hand thereon a strange uneasiness possessed me and seemed to cloud my honest courage what was it what had i to fear i did not know and yet my strong fingers that never wearied upon a hilt though the day were ne'er so long trembled as i slung round my pouch and my heart set off a beating with craven fear as it had never beat before in sack or melee it was too foolish and a little angry at the blood that ran so slowly in my veins and the heavy sense of evil that sat on me all of a sudden i pulled the metal letter-case from my wallet and burst the seal and pressed the lid the wallet split from side to side as though the stout leather were frail paper and the strong metal crumbled in my fingers like red rotten touchwood i stared at it in amazement what could it mean then shook the thin rusty fragments from my hand and putting on a bold face i did not feel drew out the parchment from the strangely frail casing brushed off the dust and litter and handed it to the sovereign lady i said in a voice i fain would have made true and clear there is the full account and though seas have stained it and rough travel spoiled the casing as you saw yet have i made all diligence i could it was yesterday morning king edward gave me that and take it he said as fast as foot can go to sweet queen philippa my wife say twas penned on battlefield and comes full charged with my dear and best affections thus madam have i brought it straight to thee from famous cressy and here place it the warrant of my truth in queen philippa's own hand and then i gave her the scroll jove how yellow and tarnished it did look the frail silk that bound it was all afray and colourless and the king's great seal that once had been so cherry red was bleached to sickly pallor the queen took it and while i held my breath in nameless terror she turned it over and slowly round about and stared first at me and then at that fatal thing she begged a dagger from a courtier at her side and split the binding and unfolded that tawny scroll that crackled in her fingers it was so old and stiff and read the address and superscription and then all on a sudden while a death-like silence held the room she turned her stern cold eyes full of wrath and wonder to me kneeling there and burst out why fellow what mummery is all this philippa and crecy why thou incredible fool philippa of hainault has been dust these twenty generations and crecy thy famous crecy was fought near three hundred years ago i am elizabeth tudor slowly i rose from my feet and stared at her stared at her in the hush of that wondering room while a cold chill of fear and consternation crept over my body credible Cressy fought three hundred years ago the hall seemed full of that horrible whisper and a score of echoes repeated queen philippa has been dust these twenty generations and Cressy, thy famous Cressy, was fought near three hundred years ago 
oh impossible cruel ridiculous and yet and yet there as i stood glaring at the queen with strained set face and clenched hands and heaving breath gasping wondering waiting for something to break that hideous silence or give the lie to that accursed sentence that still floated around on the ambient air and took new strength from the disdainful light in those clustering courtier eyes and their mocking scornful smiles while i waited i remembered by all the infernal powers i remembered my awakening and all the things i should have noted and had not i recalled the bitter throes that had racked my stiff joints in the old british grave as never mortal rooms yet twisted common sinew and muscle i recalled the long labour of the crypt thieves and the altered face of rocks and foreshore when my eyes first lit upon them after that long sleep the very april season that sorted so ill with the august crecy left behind took new meaning to me now all on an instant and my ragged crumbling raiment in shreds and tatters so ruinous as never salt spray yet made a good suit in one mortal evening the strange garb and speech of those i met and then this tawny handsome yellow lioness on the throne where should have been a pale black norman girl oh hell and fiends but she spoke the truth i had lain three hundred years in ufner's stones and with a wild fierce cry of shame and anger one long yell of pain and disappointment i tore the cursed wallet from my neck and hurled it down there savagely at her feet and turned and fled past the startled courtiers past the screaming groups of laced and ruffled women out out through the long line of feeble wardens out between the glistening lowered halberds of the guards down the white shining steps an outcast and a scoffing point down into the road i ran under a thousand wondering eyes as fast as foot could go not looking where or how but seeking only the friendly cover of solitude and the fast coming evening and then at length worn out and spent so sick in mind and heart i could scarce put one limb before another i sank down on a grassy bank a mile out of sight and sound of that fatal camp and dropped my head into my hands and let the fierce despair and the black swelling loneliness well up in my choked and aching heart End of chapter seventeen Chapter eighteen of the Wonderful Adventures of Fra the Phoenician by Edwin Lester Arnold. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. You, happy, across whose tablets a kind of fate draws the sponge of oblivion, even while you write, who leave the cup half emptied and the feast half finished. You, from whose thoughts ambition passes in warm meridian glow who nourish expectation and hope to the very verge of the unknown you who leave the warm with the sweet wine of living your dim way lit with the shine of love your fingers locked in the clasp of friendship you to whom all these things gently minister and smooth the path of the inevitable you who die but once and die so easily surely cannot comprehend the full measure of my sufferings oh it was horrible and sickening to feel the old world reel and spin like this beneath my laggard feet to see crowns and states and people flit by like idle shadows on a sunny wall to espouse great quarrels that set men into wide asunder camps and to wake and find the quarrel long since over and forgotten to swear allegiance to a king and love and serve him and then to find in the beat of a pulse that he had gone and was forgotten to be the bearer of proud news that should kindle joy in a thousand thousand hearts and then to wake when even the meaning of that news the very cause and purport of it was long since past and gone it was surely bitter and for myself i 
who as you know link a ready sympathy with any cause who love and live and hope with a fervour which no experience quenches and no adversity can dim to be thus cut adrift from all i lived and hoped for to be cast like this on to the bleak friendless shore of some age remote unknown unvalued surely it was a mischance as heavy as any mischance could be i had not any friend in all that universe i said to myself as i lay and thought sad thoughts upon the grassy mound a friend not one kind human heart in this hive of human atoms set store by me not one had heard i lived not one cared if i died there was not in all the world one question of how i fared one wish that ran in union with any wish of mine one single link to join me to my kind and what links could i forge again how could i set out to hope afresh or love or fear or wish for hope gods had i not hopes yesterday and what were they now a tawdry silly sheaf of tinselled fancies and love how could i love remembering the new dead isabel and fear and desire neither touched the accursed monotony of my desolation either would have been a boon from heaven to break the miserable calm of my despair it was thus i reasoned with myself for hours as the gathering darkness settled down and poor as i had often been and comradeless i do not think in all a long and varied life i had ever felt more reft of friends or melancholy lonesome in vain my mind was racked to piece the evidence of that huge lapse of time which there was no doubt had passed since the great battle on the crecy hills i could recall as they have been set down every incident of the voyage my escape and what had followed the awakening but the sleep itself was to me even now just one long soft dreamless well-earned slumber from point to point so absolutely natural had been that wondrous trance that to think on it would make me start up with a cry and shake my fist to where in the valley the lights of elizabeth's camp were faintly shining among the trees and half persuade myself that this were the dream that the yellow-haired princess had somehow mocked me that edward indeed still lived with my jolly comrades and i might still hope to win renown and smiles amid them and see those that i knew and drink red wine from friendly flagons then i would remember all the many signs that told the princess had not fooled me had but spoke the cruel naked truth down i would sink again on the turf under the deepening shadows and bewail my lot tossed fiercely about like this time passed unnoticed the day went out in the west behind the pale amber and green satin curtains of the sunset and while i sat and grieved the yellow stars climbed into the sky all the sweet silent planets of the night set out upon their unseen pathways and airy parabolas and behind the thicket that sheltered me the moon got up and threw across the lonely road a tracery of black and silver shadows the evening air blew strong and cool upon my flushed hot brow and lulled the teeming thoughts that crowded there soft velvet bats came down and the faint lisp of their hollow wings brushing by me was kindly and sympathetic overhead the sallows hung out a thousand golden points to the small people of the twilight and a faint perfume an incense of hope fell on me with the yellow dust of those gentle flowers if i say these cool influences somewhat respirited me you will deride my changing mood yet why should i hesitate for that i did grow calmer under the gentle caressing of the evening it was all so fair and still about me presently and there was this star that i knew and that and the night owl churning overhead was surely the very same bird that had sung above my hunter couch in the saxon woodlands and the lonely trumpet of the heron flying homeward up the valley brought back a score of peaceful memories after all men might change and go shallow small puppets that they were but this at least was the same old earth about me 
and that was something i would find a sheltered corner and sleep mayhap with to-morrow's dawn the world might look a little brighter just as this wise resolution was on the point of being put in force the faint sound of horse-hoofs demurely walking up towards my lurking-place came down on the night wind and retiring a moment into the deep shadows i had not long to wait before the same shaggy palfrey and the same dreamy old fellow met earlier in the day came pacing along the road the scholar for so i guessed him looked neither to right nor left his strange thin face was turned full up to the moonlight and the bright rays shone upon his vacant eyes and long white beard with a strange sepulchral lustre he was letting the reins hang loose upon his pony's neck and as he came near thinking himself alone he stretched out his long sinewy hands in front and it was plain to see his lips worked in the moonlight with unspoken thoughts quicker than an abbot's at an unpaid-for mass utterly oblivious to everything around in the white shine of the great night planet old lunatic and gaunt he looked methought the strangest wayfarer that ever rode down a woodland lane by nightfall he was indeed so weird and unapproachable in his reverie that though i had felt a small gleam of pleasure in first recognising something which if not friend was at least acquaintance yet now as he drew nigh remote and visionary with glassy eyes fixed on the twinkling stars and thin white locks lifting about his broad and wrinkled forehead i hesitated to greet him and stood back but that palfrey he bestrode was more watchful than his rider he saw me loom dark among the hazels and came to so sudden a stop as threw the old man forward upon his ears and whatever his fancies may have been jerk them clean from sky to earth in less time than it takes to write the scholar pulled himself together and with some show of valour threw back his wide cloak from his right shoulder and uncovered on his other side the hilt of a tarnished rusty sword then peeping and peering all about he cried ho oh, you there in the shadows be ye thieves or beggars know that i have nothing to give and less to lose and he who stops your way sir i answered stepping forward into the clear is exactly in like circumstance oh it is you friend is it cried the old man seeming much relieved i thought i had fallen into a nest of footpads or at the least a camp of beggars your open declaration sir backed by certain evidences of its obvious truth ought to have taken you safely through the worst infested thicket hereabouts no doubt no doubt but i am glad it is you and not another first because desirable friendships are rarely made by moonlight and secondly because you have been in my mind the few hours since we parted i am honoured in that particular and your courtesy moves me the more because i was only now thinking there were none upon the face of the earth who were doing so much by me you are green young man and therefore apt to let a passing whim a shadow of disappointment lead to hasty generalising you fared not as you hoped at yonder court and the old man bent his keen grey eyes upon me with a searching shrewdness there was no gainsaying no in faith i fared badly beyond all expectation and what were you projecting just now when like the ass of balaam this most patient beast saw you in the way and interrupted my reflection so roughly why at that very moment sir i said i was looking for a likely place to pass the night what on the moss with no better hanging to your couch than these lean draughty leafless boughs tis an honourable bed sir and i have fared worse when i have been far richer oh what a happy thing it is to be young and full of colour and folly not but that i have done the same myself chuckled the old man for thou knowest mandrake must be gathered only at the full moon and hemlock roots are digged in the dark many a twilight such as this i spent groping in the murky woods picking those things that witches love and not gone home with full wallet until the owls were homing and the pale white stars were waxing sickly in the morning light nevertheless sir 
take an old man's word and presume not too largely on the immunities of youth i have no drier bed no but i have come back with me to-night and i will lodge you safe and sound until the morning thanks for the proffer yet this is surely extreme courtesy between two wayfarers so newly met as we are and do i sir he cried holding out his thin and shaky palms there in the pallid light a gaunt and ragged-looking spectre a houseless homeless visionary vagrant do i sir seem some broiling spendthrift some loose hedge companion some shallow pated swashbuckler hail fellow well met with one and all i have not said so much civility as i did just now to any one these twenty years the more thanks are due from him in whose favour you make so great and generous exception is it distant to your lodgment but a few miles straight ahead of us then i will go with you for it were churlish to slight so good an offer out of bare waywardness and i tightened my belt and took the ragged ungroomed little steed by the rusty cord mended bit and with these two strange companions set out i knew not how or where and cared but little at first that quaint old man seemed more elated than could reasonably be expected at having secured me for a guest he did not openly avow it but i was not so young or unread in men but that i could decipher his pleasure in voice and eye even while he talked on other subjects how this interest came what he could hope to get or have of me however was well past my comprehension my dress and rustic garb spoke me his inferior in place and station while certes my rags and tatters made me seem poor even after my humble kind he was a gentleman though the sorriest looking one who ever put a leg across a saddle and i i was a foot a gloomy purseless unweaponed loiterer in the shadows what could he need of me that lent such lustre to his eyes and caused him to chuckle so hoarsely far down in his lean and withered throat the morrow no doubt would show and in the meantime being still morose and sad smarting to have unwittingly played the fool so much and full of grief and sorrow i responded but dully to his learned talk feeling this and being only slenderly attached to mundane things at best his mind wandered from me after a mile or two his eyes grew fixed and expressionless his hands dropped supine upon the pummel his chin sank down upon the limp worn yellow ruffles on his chest and senseless disconnected murmurs ran from his lips like water dripping from a leaky cask i let him babble as he liked and trudged along in silence leaving the road to that sagacious beast who with drooped head and stolid purpose went pacing on without a look either to right or left and you will guess my thoughts were melancholy yesterday i was an honoured soldier the confidant of a proud victorious king the comrade of a shining band of princely brethren as good a knight as any that breathed among a host of heroes the clear honoured leading star the bright example to a horde of stalwart veterans with all the fair wide fields of renown and reputation lying inviting before me all the pleasant leith of struggle and ambition open to my search and i had strong true friends abroad and loving ones at home and now and now oh i beat my hand upon my bosom and spent impotent curses on the starlight sky to think how all was changed to think how those splendid princely shadows were gone how all those sweet rough spearmen who had ridden with me fetlock deep through the crimson mire of crecy that passed out into the void leaving me here desolate poor accursed this empty hand that trained the spear that had shot princes and paladins to earth under the full gaze of crowned christendom turned to a low horse-boy's duty my golden mail changed to a hedgeman's muddy smock on foot degraded friendless and forlorn but it was no good grieving my melancholy served somehow to pass the way and when presently i shook it off again with one fierce final sigh and peered about 
we were slowly winding down a dark road between high banks into a deeply wooded glen lying straight ahead i had noticed now and then as we came along a twinkling light or two standing off from the white roadway amid the deep black shadows of the evening and each time had slowed my gloomy stride thinking this were the place we aimed for now it was a shepherd's lonely cot high perched amid the open firs and ling with a faint red beam of warmth and light coming from the glowing hearth within ah here we be i thought so learning is lodged with fleecy simplicity and cons his ovid amid the things the sweet latin loved or reads bucolic horace beneath a herdsman's oak but that glum palfrey did not stop and his fantastic master made no sign then it would be a wayside cottage all criss-cross faced with beam of wood after the new fashion and overgrown with rose and eglantine then this is it i sighed a comely peaceful harbourage one could surely lie safer from the winds of blustering fortune in this tiny shell than a small white maggot in a winter hidden nut and i put my hand upon the dim trestle gate but stamp stamp the steed went on and the master never took his chin from off his bosom well we had passed in this way some few small homesteads and seen the glow-worm lights of a fair sleeping tudor village or two shine remote in the starlight valleys and then we came all at the same solemn pace the same gloomy silence into that deep shadowed dell i spoke of we dipped down out of the honest white radiance between high banks on either hand so high that bush and shrub were locked in tangles overhead and not a blink of light came through down that strange black zigzag we slipped and scrambled the loose stones rattling beneath our feet in pitchy darkness with never a sound to break the stillness but the heavy breathing of the horse and now and then the gurgle of an unseen streamlet running somewhere in the void we staggered down this hell-dark pathway for a lonely mile and then there loomed up from the blackness on my right hand a mouldy broken terrace wall all loose and cracked with fallen coping slabs and pedestals displaced and hideous stony graven monsters here and there glowering in the blackness at us who passed below two hundred paces down this wall we went and then came to an opening at the same moment the pale moon shone out full overhead and showed me a gate a garden and beyond an empty mansion so white so ruinous and ghastly so marvellously like a dead expressionless face suddenly gleaming over the black pall of the night that i tightened my hand upon the snaffle strap i held and bit my lip and thanked my fate it was not there i had to sleep yet could i not help staring at that place the wall turned in on either side to meet those gates they had once been noble and well wrought and gilded for here and there the better metal shone in spots amid the wide expanse of rusty iron that formed them but now they were like the broken fangs methought of some old hag more than aught else the left of these two rotten portals never opened the nettle and wild creepers were twined thick about its shattered lower bars while its fellow stood ajar with one hinge gone and sagging over desperately envious it seemed of the small footway that wound amid the rank wild herbage past it and then that garden jove was ever such a ghostly wilderness such a tangled labyrinth of decay and neglect born out of the kind fertile bosom of gentle mother earth never before had i seen black cypresses throw such funereal shadows never had i known the winter-worn things of summer look so ghoul-like and horrible but worst of all was the mansion beyond a straggling pile with mighty chimney-stacks from whence no pleasant smoke curled up and silent grassy courtyards and lonely flights of broken steps leading to lonely terraces and a hundred empty windows staring empty socketed back upon the dead white light that shone so straight and cruel upon them oh 
it was all most forlorn and melancholy surely an unholy place steeped deep with the indelible stain of some black story and i turned me gladly from it i turned and as i did so the horse came to a sudden stop stopped calm and resolutely before that ill-omened portal this woke his master who stared and looked up he saw the house and gates in the full stream of the moonlight and then turned to me welcome he cried right welcome to my home oh you shall sleep snug enough to-night look at the shine on't they have lit up to welcome us and he pointed with a long fleshless finger to those ghostly windows oh came like a dead voice the echo of his laughter out of the blank courtyard depth and the old man so strange and wild struck his rusty spurs upon the bare sounding ribs of his beast and turned and rode straight through the portal for one minute i held back it was all so grim and tragic looking and i was weak shaken with grief and fasting unweaponed and alone for one minute i held back and then the red flush of anger burnt hot upon my forehead to think i had been so near to fearing i tossed back my black phrygian locks and with an angry stride my spirit roused by that moment's weakness strode sternly across the threshold down the white gravel way we twined the loose neglected path gleaming wet with night dew we brushed by thickets of dead garden things such as had once been tall and fair but now tainted the night air with their rottenness we stepped over giant brambles and great fallen hemlocks little hedge pigs so forsaken was it all trotting down the path before us and bats flitting about our heads in one place had been a fountain and pan himself standing by it the fountain was choked with giant dock and cress wherefrom some frogs croaked with dismal glee while pan had fallen and lay in pieces on his face across the way so we came in a moment or two to the house and there my guide dismounted and pulled bit and bridle saddle and saddle cloth from his pony that beast turned and stepped back into the shadows of the desolate garden vanishing with strange suddenness but whither i could not guess then the old man produced a green rusty key from under his belt and putting it to the lock of the door at top of that flight of broken steps which looked as though no foot had trodden them for fifty years he turned the rusty wards the grind and wail of those stiff bolts had almost human sadness in it and then we entered a long lonely chilly hall here my guide felt for flint and steel and i own i heard the click of the stone and metal and saw the first spark spring and die upon the pavement with reasonable satisfaction twould have made a good picture had some one been by to limn it that ghastly pale face that might have topped a skeleton so bloodless was it with sharp keen eyes a glint in the red glow that came presently upon the tinder that strange slouch hat that ragged sorrel graveyard cloak and all about the gleam glancing off the crumbling finery the worm-eaten furniture the broken tilestones the empty voiceless corridors the doors set half ajar the great carved banisters of the stairway that mounted into the black upper emptiness of that deserted hall and then i myself there by the porch watchful and grim in my sorry rags the greatest wonder of it all eyeing with haughty speculation that old fellow so ancient and yet so young tottering and venerable under the weight of a poor eighty years perhaps while it was three times as much since strong-limbed supple i had even sat to a meal it was truly strange and i waited for anything that might come next with calm resignation a listless faith in the integrity of chance which put me beyond all those gusty emotions of hope and fear which play through the fledgling hearts of lesser men the red train of sparks lit upon the tinder while i glanced around the old man's breath blew them into a flame and this he set to a rushlight then turned that pale flame in my direction 
as he surveyed his guest from top to toe i bore the inspection with folded arms and when he had done he said such thews and sinews son as show beneath that hempen shirt of yours such breadth of shoulder and stalwartness can scarcely be nourished on evening dew and sad reflections have you eaten lately in truth sir it was some time ago i last sat to meal was my response and whether it be our walk or the night air i could almost fancy your father's father might have shared that meal with me well come then to the banquet hall the feast is spread and for guests people these shadows with whom you will and taking the rushlight from its socket and hobbling off in front that strange host of mine led down the corridor to where a great archway led into the main chamber of the house it was as desolate and silent as every other place vast roomy blank and gloomy all along one side were latticed windows looking out upon that dead garden and the moonbeams coming through them threw faint reflections of escutcheon and painted glass upon the dusty floor here and there the panes were broken and draughts from these swayed the frayed and tattered hangings with ghostly undulations ah and at the top of the room an open door leading into unknown blackness kept softly opening and shutting in the current as though with melancholy monotony it was giving admittance to unseen voiceless company but nothing said my friend to excuse all this he led up the long black table with rows of seats and benches fit to seat an hundred guests until at the lonely top he found and lit the four branches of a little oil lamp of green mouldy bronze such as one takes from ancient crypts and when the four little flames grew up smoky and dim they shone upon a napkin ready laid a flask a pitcher and a plate flanked by a horn-handled knife and spoon and an oaken salt cellar then the old earl next went to a cupboard in a niche and brought out bread on a trencher a cheese upon a round leaden dish and a curious flask of old italian wine i stared at my host in wonder for i could have sworn a saxon hand had trimmed his knife and spoon his lamp was etruscan as truly as i lived though heaven only knew how he came by it and that picture why jove i knew the very roman pottery marks upon it the maker's sign and name the very kiln that glazed it he laid a plate for me and cut the loaf and filled our tankards and eat he said the feast is small but we have that sauce the wise have told us would make a worse into a banquet thanks i said i have in truth sat to wider spreads yet this is more than i could a few short hours since have reasonably hoped for and so i began and broke his bread and turned about the cheese and poured the wine and made a very good repast out of such modest provender but as you may guess between every mouthful i could not help looking up and about me at the wise mad features of that quaint old man now far away and visionary again lost in thought and fantasy and then out through the broken mullions into that pallid garden of white spectral things and inky shadows lying so death-like in the moonshine and so once more my eye would wander to the long sombre hall the stately high-backed chairs all rickety and moth-eaten and the door that gently opened now and then to admit the sighing of the night wind and nothing more well i will not weary you with experiences so empty at last the most spectral meal that ever mortal sat to was over and the old man roused himself and like one who comes reluctantly from deep thought drained out his goblet to the dregs and turned it down and swept the crumbs into his plate and standing up said in a somewhat friendly tone you will be weary stranger guest and mayhap i am to-night but a poor host if it pleased you i would show you to a chamber which though mayhap somewhat musty like much else of mine shall nevertheless be drier than yon couch of yours out there by the hazel thicket musty or not good sir i do confess a bed will be welcome 
it must be near four hundred years at least that is to say it must be very long my sleepy eyes suggest since i was lain on one come then yet half a minute sir before we go this garb of mine i do not deign to advert to its poorness for my own sake but it does such small credit to your honour and hospitality fortune in other times gave me the right to wear the hose and surtout of a gentleman if you had such a livery by you the scholar thought a space then bid me stay where i was and took the rushlight and went down the passage in a few minutes he was back with a swathe of faded raiment upon his arm and threw them down upon the bench there choose he cried it was like a young man to think of to-morrow's clothing between supper-time and bed the raiment was as mysterious as everything else hereabout it was all odds and ends and quaint old fashions and tags of finery the faded panoply of state and pride the green vest of a forest ranger the gabardine of a marshal of the lists suits for footmen with the devices i had seen upon the ruined gates worked on the front in golden thread and some few courtly things such as idle young lords will wear a day or two and then throw by to wear some newer out of the latter i selected a suit that looked as though it would fit me and though a little crumpled was still in reasonable condition this vestment after the fashion of the time consisted of tight hose and much puffed breeches a fine silk waistcoat coming far down and a loose and ample coat upon it with wide shoulders and long tight sleeves when i add this suit was of amber velvet lined and puffed with primrose satin you will understand that saving the certain mouldiness about it i have mentioned it was as good as any reasonable man could desire i rolled it up and put it under my arm then turned to my host with something of a smile at the strangeness of it all a supper sir i said and shelter a suit of velvet and then a bed why surely this is rare civility between two chance companions met on a country road ah answered the old man and if you were as old as i am you would know it is rare but that such things must somehow be paid for and he eyed me curiously a moment from under those penthouse eyebrows is there anything more you lack he continued to-night it is yours to ask and mine to give since you put it to me worthy host i responded there is one other thing i need something a soldier likes whether it be in court or camp in peaceful hall like this or on the ridges of a dank battlefield a straight white comrade that i could keep close to me all day a dear companion who would lie nigh by my side at night believe me i have never been without such and believe me young man i cannot humour you fie if that's your fancy why did you leave yon wanton camp gads but they would have lined you there civilly enough but i what do you think i can conjure you a pretty painted lemon for a plaything out of these black shadows all about us whereat i answered seriously you mistake my meaning sir it was no gentle damsel that i needed but such a companion as i have ever had in brief a weapon a sword it was only this i thought of i heard the old man mutter as he turned away a curse on young men and their wants new suits supper and wine lemon weapons oh it's just the same with all of them and he took the taper from the table and signed me to follow he led me down the hall with its bare cold flagstones and sombre panelling dimly seen under the feeble gleaming light he carried and in a few paces my grim host stopped and held that shine aloft it shone redly on a tarnished trophy of arms chain-mail and helmets whence he bid me choose whatever took my fancy making the while small effort to hide his contempt for the obvious eagerness and pleasure with which i sampled that dusty hoard after a minute or two i selected a strong spanish blade a little light and playful perhaps with golden arabesques all down it and a pretty fluted hollow for the foeman's blood and a chaste love-knot at the hilt yet nevertheless a good blade and serviceable with an edge as keen as a lover's eye 
and a temper as true as ever was got into good steel i thought as i sprang it on the tiles between hammer and anvil this toledo blade had a cover of black velvet bound and hooped with silver bands and a stout belt of like kind nicely suiting that livery i carried upon my arm i bound the sword about me and after being so long unweaponed found it wondrous comfortable and pleasant wear now then sir host i cried lead on if this chamber of thine were in the porch of paradise or in the nethermost pit of hell i am equally ready to explore it up the gloomy stairs we went now to right and then to left by corridors and passages until the road we came was hopelessly mazed to me and soon my host led to a wider gloomier avenue of silent doorways than any we had passed choose he laughed choose you a bed better men than you have lodged and died within these cheerful chambers and that wild old man with furrowed face and mad sparkling eyes seeming in that small round globe of light like some spectral remnant of the fortunes of his lonely house opened door after door for me to note the grim black solitudes within in every chamber hung the same staring portraits on the wall cold proud dead eyes fixed hard upon you wherever you might look on every rotten cornice were tattered hangings half shrouding those dim cobwebbed windows that gazed so wistfully out upon the moonlit garden and dusky panel doors and cupboard casements that gently creaked and moved upon the sighing draught till you could swear ghostly fingers played upon the latches the same stern black furniture crumbling and decayed was in each set straight against the walls the same cenotaph four-posted bedsteads with ruined tapestries and mouldy coverlets choose he laughed with a horrid goblin laughter that rattled down the empty corridors my house is roomy though the guests be few and silent but in truth there was little to choose where all was so alike therefore and not to seem the least bit moved by all this dreadfulness i threw down my borrowed clothes and rapier upon the settle in one of the first rooms we happed upon and said here then good host and thanks for courteous harbourage what time doth sound rivalli what time i mean doth thy household wake my household stranger sleeps on for ever they will not wake for any mortal sunrise i spend the long night hours in work and vigil and he looked at me with the gloomy fanaticism of an absent mind yet you must wake again he went on after a minute i have something to ask thee to-morrow perhaps something to show why then until we meet again good night and pleasant vigils since it is to them you go good night young man and sober sleep remember this is no place to dream of tilts and tawnies of lost causes or light lemon love and muttering to himself as he shuffled down the bare dusty floors i heard him pass away from corridor to corridor and flight to flight until even that faint sound was swallowed by the cavernous silence of the sepulchral mansion and night and impenetrable stillness fell on those empty stairways and gaunt voiceless rooms End of chapter 18